Our third Bible reading for tonight comes from Luke chapter 23, verses 32 to 34, and will serve as the basis of our message tonight. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And they bite up his clothes by casting lots. This is the word of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Crucifixion is a fact. Romans were doing it. They would execute the worst of the worst by this means. Their external evidence outside of the Bible, it tells us, yeah, a man named Jesus was crucified. It happened. So as the hymn asks, were you there? Were you there when they crucified our Lord? We hear that reading. And just kind of washes over very quickly. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Maybe because you read it out of a book, it's kind of like, oh, it just, it happened. Yeah? Went to the place of the skull, Bogotha, to Calvary, and they crucified him. He died. Okay. So what? It takes a minute to actually step back and remember what was crucifixion like. We don't see it every day, and, and probably the one that still burned into my brain that I remember, of course, was the movie The Passion of the Christ that came out, probably, I don't know, it's like 20 years old now. It was very deserving of its R rating, because it tried to accurately depict the crucifixion of Jesus. I've only ever watched it once, because that's all my stomach could take. To see what was happening to him, to remember the sequence of events, how the soldiers bitterly mocked him, that they struck him with their fists, bruised, battered, beaten, black eyes, and then they would spit on him, just out of spite, of hatred. They took and wrapped a crown of thorns and they place it on his head, and, and you think, like, place it, oh, just kind of gently. No, they put it there, and then they smashed his head with a, a wooden rod. And they flogged him, but not just with any old whip, but with a scourge, where they put little pieces of, of metal and bone and rock on the end of it, so that it purposely would hit the skin and dig in and tear And then they put him on the cross and they drove the nails through his hands and through his feet and lifted him up as a display of what you get when you're worthy of death. And in all that, Jesus says a prayer. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Yeah, forgive them. Forgive them, God, because I, I wasn't there. Forgive them. Forgive those nasty leaders. Forgive Pontius Pilate, who had no spine and washed his hands of the whole incident and just allowed an innocent man to be condemned to death. Forgive those people, God, those religious rulers that went out of their way, broke their own laws, jury-rigged this whole trial, came up with excuses just so that they could come and say he was worthy of death. Forgive them, God. Forgive those soldiers. Maybe they were just doing their duty, but I'm sure they had some delight as they cast lots for Jesus' clothing, knowing that this would make them just that little bit richer. Forgive those criminals because they obviously had done something so bad that they themselves were worthy of capital punishment, but they too were heaping insults on Jesus. 
Maybe God even forgive the disciples who were there who stood back and did nothing, John and the women. Forgive them, God, because I wasn't there. No, none of us were there physically. But maybe there are more there than we realize. Maybe more there than we want to admit. God was there. Jesus was praying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The Father was listening. The Holy Spirit was strengthening Jesus. And Jesus himself, we know, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was made flesh and made his dwelling among us. God was certainly there, and just as Isaiah had prophesied, he was there knowing that he was carrying out his own will. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. The Lord makes his life an offering for sin. But not just God was there. Isaiah was there. Isaiah wrote, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. We, all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah knew he was there, along with all of the Israelites, that on this suffering servant, he would bear this punishment, this wrath, and this execution, and he would benefit. He would have peace. He would be healed. You know, think about the Passion of Christ. Think about that movie, famously directed by Mel Gibson. Regardless of what you think of Mel, it is the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time, but there's another little piece of trivia I want to give you. The director makes a cameo. And no, you won't see his face. He's not one in the crowd, he's not one of the disciples. It's only his hands. His hands are the ones that drive the nails into Jesus' hands. Because think what you want of Mel Gibson, but he at least understood this was happening for me. Jesus was pierced for my sins. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Yeah, we do something wrong. And sometimes there's an immediate consequence. Sometimes there's immediately something that happens to us because of what we did. And then there's a whole lot of other times that we do something wrong and we seemingly just kind of get away with it. Nothing bad immediately happens. The sky doesn't fall. I'm not struck dead. And it's kind of like, well, I guess it really doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter if I sin. It doesn't really matter if I do something wrong because if it really was that bad, something would happen. Do we know what we do when we sin? Sometimes we know what we're doing. Sometimes we don't even know what we're doing. But we have to admit, our sins were there. That's why Jesus went to the cross. And to think what it cost him, what our Sins cost him. For that person who cut you off on I-15 and you shouted some nice four-letter words, waving your fist, expressing your anger, for the time when you were at home and you just had a rough day, it shouldn't have made you mad, but it did. And so you yell at your wife and your kids. At the time, 
that you shared that story, that you knew, would just drag that person's name through the mud. For the time, when you said, God, you don't care. I don't need you. Everything drove those nails into his hands. That's what they cost. But Jesus did not go on that cross unwillingly or ignorantly. He let them drive those nails into his hands because he was thinking of you and me. He knew what all of our sins cost. So he let them drive the nails in because he was going to answer that prayer, the same one he offered, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. The nails pierced his hands so that when it was all done, the Father would say, they are forgiven for everything that they have done, everything you have done. Whether you knew what you did, whether you didn't know what you did, Jesus let those nails go through to hang our sins on the cross, to substitute himself for us. He allowed his hands to be pierced with those nails so that he could declare to you, it's fully paid. Nothing is owed. You are forgiven. You are loved. And you are accepted. Jesus went through everything we're going to hear about tonight so that that prayer would be answered for you. That if you're wondering, does God forgive me? The nails into his hands say, yes, you are forgiven. That's the message of Jesus' nail-pierced hands. And the hope that we can still have on this day, on Good Friday, by his wounds, we are healed. Amen.